Today we'll be looking at the Liberty of the Clink, which is an area in Southwark, in the South Bank in London. A few things. I could not speak in this video. I'm tripping over a further word, so please excuse that. I also went a bit heavy with a blush. Uh -huh. <laughs> So today we'll be looking at the Liberty of the Clink. So it's an area in Southwark opposite the city of London. The area was designated name in 1127 and the Liberty of the Clink ceased to exist in 1889. So the Liberty was outside the jurisdiction of London, meaning that it didn't have to follow the same rules as the city. The summer activities that were banned in the city of London were permitted in this area. Things like prostitution, bear basing, theatres, those fun sort of things that people wanted to do but couldn't do in the city, they would go to Southwark and the Liberty of the Clink to do so. so. This area was exempt from the jurisdiction of the Sheriff's County High Court and the Bishop of Winchester oversaw the area rather than a reigning monarch. So I thought we'd look at things that I found interesting around the area rather than doing like a chronological thing. So I thought first if we look at the stews, so in 1161 Bishop Henry of Blois, 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 Blau, Blois, Six and a half hours later was granted power to license prostitutes and brothels in the Liberty by King Henry II. So those brothels were also referred to as stews and in 1161 Henry II put 39 rules into play called the ordinances touching the government of the stew holders in Southwark under the direction of the Bishop of Winchester. So the ordinances put in some new rules to protect punters as well as to protect the prostitutes themselves as well as like brothel owners. So the first thing it ensured was that all new prostitutes to the area registered officially that they could ensure they knew exactly who was operating in the area and also to deter people from operating illegally, running their own brothels without paying proper taxes through them. It also ensured that prostitutes could not work on religious holidays, they were banned from cursing, they put in new rules which meant that nuns and married women couldn't join the stews. It also prohibited the prostitutes from taking on their own lovers. So for instance, they could take on a new relationship if they weren't seeking to gain money from it. If they did so and pursue romantic relationships outside of the stews, they were penalised with fines, prison sentences, and could be dumped in the sewage on a cucking stool. It's also sometimes referred to as a ducking stool, so like either C or D, but effectively they would be put onto a little seat and dipped into raw sewage if they did not follow the set guidelines for them. So in 1500, there were 18 registered brothels along the bank side. It's estimated that 350 women worked within these brothels and another 650 operated illegally. Basically means that they weren't within a registered brothel in the area. So you're looking at about a thousand sex workers working within this one strip of land. The prostitutes were known as Winchester geese as the Bishop of Winchester gave them the permission to work in this area. Many of the prostitutes were buried in Crossbones graveyard, which was an unconsecrated graveyard. That, that you, um, you had, you, you, you could, you do. So it's not exactly known when the graveyard was first used. They're saying it's post-medieval as the first time that it would have been used as a graveyard. It's first mentioned by John Stowe in a survey of London, which was recorded in 1598. It was referred to at this time as a single woman's graveyard. However, it's thought that half of the people interred in the graveyard were children. Up to 15,000 people are believed to be buried in the site. And by 1769, it became a pauper's graveyard, which was servicing the St. Saviour's Parish. It closed in 1853 after a complete outcry over public health concerns about internment and safe burial sites. If anyone's interested in that, I did that for my diss. I don't know, write a comment if you want to know. <laughs> no. It's very dark. It's interesting. Oh, I think it's interesting. But that's all that matters. So Crossbones was an area that was also frequented by body snatchers. So body snatchers were people that would go around stealing dead bodies from recently interred graves and they would then sell them to hospitals and universities so that they could get money for selling the body and the hospital and universities could further their research on anatomy and human dissection. Bodies from Crossbones graveyard were taken to Southwark Guys Hospital and other local universities. David Orme, in his 2012 book, The Body Snatcher's Apprentice, suggests that the fact there were fences and big walls placed around the graveyard, as well as the fact that there were local inhabitants living around the area, 
it didn't actually seek to deter people. People would still go in and steal bodies, even if they thought they were going to get caught. As stated by Helen MacDonald, the College of Surgeons had the right to the bodies of all people executed in London. However, there weren't many people executed per year, so they had to seek alternative means of getting bodies to research and dissect, and that's when the relationship between medical men and body snatchers came into play. So Parliament passed the Anatomy Act in 1832, and they simultaneously repealed the earlier Murder Act, which is how they got the bodies of murderers and criminals. So instead now, surgeons would be given access to the bodies of people who died in charitable institutions, things like workhouses and hospitals. If these bodies were not claimed for burial by family members or friends, then they would be passed over to the surgeons to dissect. And one thing that kind of raises the issue with this is that, yeah, you are stopping people from being dug up and people thought it was a good thing, but then you're just putting additional pressure onto people who are poor not to be poor anymore. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you don't deserve a proper burial. And it kind of equated murderers and poor people to the same level as to what their treatment should be. Anyway, that's by the by, that's nothing to do with Suffolk really, but it interested me. So we're now going to theatres, playhouses, those sort of institutions where people could go and watch something. So theatres and playhouses were permitted in a clink. The first playhouse on Bankside was The Rose, which was built in 1587. The second was The Swan, built in 1595. The third was The Globe, probably the most notable one, built in 1599. And the fourth was the Hope, built in 1614. So the Rose was built by Philip Henslow and was a 14-sided design. It was demolished in 1606 and Marlowe's plays were performed there, but was decaying by 1632 and was pulled down and was last recorded in popular culture in 1634. So the Globe was built by Cuthbert Burbage in 1599. It burned down in a fire on June 29th, 1613, after sparks from a theatrical cannon set alight some thatch like hey the globe fell into disuse after the puritans banned performances from taking place in 1642 and it was demolished by the order of the puritan city authorities on april 15 1644 i guess it's getting mildly boring over here for me the hope was built as a bear baiting arena and also used as a playhouse however the use of it as a playhouse was short-lived due to the smell of the arena itself it was closed down in 1653 and pulled down in 1656 By the Victorian era, or probably before this to be honest, Southwark had become one of the worst slums in London. It's estimated that it's about the late 18th, early 19th century is when it started to become a, like registered as a slum or known as a slum. So crime and cholera were rife in the area and many escaped to the area if they had committed a crime. Policemen were fearful to go into the area to get people out for their crimes, so they were kind of protected if they went to the area. The slums were cleared between 1881 to 1889. We're now going to the Clink Prison. If you've walked down South Bank, you might have seen there's a gibbeted skeleton, which is like a skeleton or a fake skeleton, in a cage hanging off a wall. So prisoners who are sentenced to death would either be anatomised and dissected or they're going to be gibbeted, which is like you would get put into the cage and left to rot. And you're placed quite high up so people couldn't steal your body or try to bury you and you'd be left there to rot until you're just your skeleton and then they take you down. It was used as a deterrent to other people to stop other people doing the same crime as you did and also to deny you the right to a Christian burial. So the clink operated from 11... Mm -hmm. From 1144 until 1780. The prison served the Liberty of the Clink, which was a local manor area that we've been talking about. So the Liberty was abolished in 1889 when the Local Government Act of 1888 merged all remaining liberties to their surrounding counties. So the Liberty of the Clink was actually surrounded by Surrey. Don't know if you're watching this, Maggie, but if you are, hi. I'm good about where you are. And the 1888 Act created a new county of London in the metropolitan area and the Liberty of the Clink was merged into this to become a new county. That's it. I could not get my words out today. Oh. I know. I know, it wasn't really a very in-depth history, it was just interesting things. I think it's interesting you walk past these places and I never really knew any of them. So if you're ever walking down the South Bank, going through Southwark, I'm gonna go and get, I don't know, a nice brunch in Borough. Now you know. Thank you for watching and yeah, I'll be back with something more in-depth soon. Thanks, bye!